Forget it. This game's not for you. No, it's just, you know, I was thinking it'd be a kick. David, you're a nice guy. I like you. Okay? But trust me, this game's not for you. I don't want to see you get hurt. That's a scene from The Sopranos. Here, Tony is luring his lifelong friend into a card game that he can't afford. He told me not to get in the game. Why'd you let me do it? Well, I knew you had this business here, Davey. It's my nature. Frog and the scorpion, you know? <laughs> hey, you're not the first guy to get busted out. This is how a guy like me makes a living. This is my bread and butter. Yeah, the scorpion and the frog, isn't that the way it is? I mean, some of us are just by nature put here to exploit other people. That's what we do. He ended up working for the New York Police Department. They brought him in and said, can you figure out what's going on with this prostitution problem that we have? And so he was put in charge of figuring out prostitution. He said it took him three weeks to figure out that everything we learned about prostitution was BS. Prostitution at the, its core is about human trafficking. The majority, 99% of them are forced to be there. And if they don't do their work, the stuff that happens to them is really incredible. And then he also talks about the human compromise. The human compromise at the very highest levels. Admirals in the military, CEOs, people running for president. So compromise, I get a prostitute, and when I say prostitute, that, that sometimes maybe conjures up the wrong image, because in some cases, yes, it is some woman, and we can th- and we can imagine it like pretty woman on, in the movie, but it's nothing like that. But in other cases, we can't even pretend like it's that when it's an 11-year-old boy or a 9-year-old girl or all these other really sick things that are out there. But let's lump all that together. And then we have an apartment in some room in the back of that apartment that has a bunch of hidden cameras and microphones in it. The target is going to be lured back in there. And then at the end of the day, the person who was taping it, the person who has that stuff is going to go knock on that guy's door and say, look what I got. What are you going to do now? Or, or I'll tell you what you're going to do now. You know, I've explored this topic before on Skeptico, and I've always come at it more from the spiritual angle in terms of the nature of evil. Is there evil? Because the Crowley and Luciferian do what thou wilt, fuzzy morality around evil never seemed very satisfying to me, and I always wanted to approach the topic from that direction. What's interesting about today's show with the extraordinary investigative journalist who you just heard, Sarah Westall, is that she takes us into this same evil from a different direction, the pragmatic, Tony Soprano, get things done perspective. Sarah Westall is doing great work, and I commend her for bravely covering this topic that is systematically and intentionally ignored by the mainstream media for reasons that are all too obvious. I hope you enjoy my interview with Sarah Westall. Today we welcome Sarah Westall to Skeptico. Sarah is a successful corporate IT professional turned entrepreneur turned investigative journalist and independent broadcaster. I ran across Sarah's amazing YouTube channel where she, she where she's published some really highly controversial interviews that in some ways intersect with some of the topics we've been bumping into here on Skeptico. So out of the blue, more or less, I invited her on, and I'm super glad that she agreed to join me. Sarah, welcome to Skeptico. Thanks again so much for joining me. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's my pleasure. Well, as I just kind of alluded to, we're going to have to stitch this together a little bit in terms of where I'm coming from with a science and spirituality podcast that's mainly focused on consciousness to where you're at, but I'm open to where that goes because I really don't know much about you other than your work. So let's start. Tell folks, who is Sarah Westall? Well, yeah, I guess I don't. (laughs) Who is Sarah Westall? I could tell you what I do for my work. Let's go with that. My, My channel and what I'm trying to do is 
document the edge of society and what we're doing. You know, and I really started with science and changes in business and all these things. And then you, you run into a lot of the corruption because I couldn't understand why such amazing advances in science and business wasn't allowed to go forward when it helped so many people. So I started to really dive into what's going on with society as well, because that affects the edge of change. It's always about the edge of change and what's going on and the edge of our understanding. So I, I deal with science and, and business and society and politics, all trying to get into the cutting edge of what's going on. And that brings me into a lot of corruption. It brings me into consciousness conversations. It brings me into religion. It brings me into all those things that are affecting us in society right now. There's so much change going on and I know you feel it. Everybody feels it. And I am in the process of how do we document this and understand it in a very ethical and moral way, moral way so that we can get people understanding it as well and the conversation going so that we can move in a direction that we feel good about as a society. Okay. You're keeping it really high level there. We'll, we'll have to dig a little bit deeper. Okay, I can do that. Intrigued. I'm intrigued by your by your personal background, but I don't want to go too far into that other than to maybe elaborate on what you just mentioned. If someone goes to your website, they'll find this business game changers, which you alluded to and seems to be your public professional brand, if you will. But these interviews, and you've framed them up one way, but I think most people who encounter, for example, your interview with retired New York City detective Jimmy Boots, who has personal knowledge of some very, very high level, highly politically connected people who were involved in just the most horrible sex crimes against children. And, and then the, the, the headline from this interview for me is that he believes that somewhere between 30 at the absolute minimum to 70% of every significant government, military, intelligence, official is compromised. So you, you go from business game changers to that and to an interview with Kevin Arnett, a priest, Canadian in the Catholic Church, who has personally witnessed high-ranking clergy members performing occult and satanic practices carried out inside church grounds. I mean, this, you know, so you can stitch that back together the way that you did. And I appreciate, so appreciate the way you framed it up of the edge of change and the edge of understanding. But doesn't this just rock our world in a way that we can't really put the pieces back together? Don't you feel that? Well, it's, it's full of trauma, right? But if you're going to heal and you know doctors know this the part of the healing process is facing the trauma if you ignore the trauma you can't heal from it and especially if you can't stop what's causing the trauma in the first place you obviously can't heal and in the case of jimmy boots he really came across the point of human compromise so all this stuff is about human compromise. The people in power want to control others and they do it through human compromise. It's all about forcing people to do what they need them to do. And they don't care about the actual people who they hurt in the process because they feel the ends justify the means, whatever their ends are. Sarah, let's break that down for folks because there's a, a lot to cover there that I think probably you and I will jump right into and maybe leave people behind. Number one, the biggest hurdle I see for the people I talk to is the how can this be issue. So people want to just dismiss all this stuff and refuse to believe it because they're, hey, I'm an intelligent person, I read the news, whatever my news source is, if this stuff was really happening at this level, I would know about it. So the first thing that the Jimmy Boots series of interviews you do 
the first thing that accomplishes is that that shatters that. So at least to me, it does. Can you tell us, you know, maybe background who Jimmy Boots is and why we should listen to him and then what the main finding or observation or discovery he had. And then secondarily, I really want to dive into this compromise thing as one of the motivations behind it. Do you, is that okay? That's fine. Uh, Jimmy Boots is probably the most respected CIA, it's not CIA, but intelligence agent out there, period. No one. I mean, when I have people on my show, I get pushback from, you know, every guest, I get some kind of pushback that this person doesn't know what they're doing. No one pushes back against Jimmy Boots because everyone in the intelligence agencies and everyone knows that what he says is true. It's, it's actually very remarkable because he personally witnesses this stuff and he personally documented things. He was, uh, besides being in the military and then was serving on different missions and things that were also probably top secret, oh, I know they were, he ended up working for the New York Police Department and he was a detective. And at that time, there were a lot of women young women who were walking the strip. It was called the Minnesota strip. They were prostitutes. And because he was from Minnesota, they brought him in and said, can you figure out what's going on with this prostitution problem that we have? And so he was put in charge of figuring out prostitution. He said it took him three weeks to figure out that everything we learned about prostitution was BS. Prostitution at the, its core is about human trafficking. When you see all these women thinking that they're there because they want to be, they're the people walking the street. They're all the majority, 99% of them are forced to be there. And if they don't do their work, the stuff that happens to them is really incredible. And so he talks about that. And, and, and then he also talks about the human compromise that was all tied into that. And he got into, you know, the, the human compromise at the very highest levels of government, politics, everything he had, uh, the his uh some of him his informants were also informants for or also were involved with high level compromising of you know um admirals in the military ceos people running for president uh you know it, it, lots i can't remember everything at this my point so compromise i get a I get a prostitute and when i say prostitute that that sometimes maybe conjures up the wrong image because in some cases yes it is some woman and we can think and we can imagine it like pretty woman on, on the movie but it's nothing like that but in other cases we can't even pretend like it's that when it's an 11 year old boy or a nine year old girl or all these other really sick things that are out there, but let's lump all that together. And then we have an apartment and some room in the back of that apartment that has a bunch of hidden cameras and microphones in it. And the person, the target is going to be lured back in there. And then at the end of the day, the person who was taping it, the person who has that stuff is going to go knock on that guy's door or that woman's door. But 99% of the time it's a guy's door and say, look what I got. What are you going to do now? Or, or I'll tell you what you're going to do now. Well, you know, as more women get into Congress, they're compromised as well. But what happened was originally, or, you know, a couple decades ago, you could compromise people with women. You could compromise people with homosexuality. Our society has changed a lot where it's really difficult to compromise somebody just because they're there with a prostitute, right? I mean, does it, people don't care that much anymore about that. They don't care that much about homosexuality, homosexuality anymore, but everybody cares about being with a child. And so compromising people with children is really the preferred method at this point, but it's beyond just uh, compromising. They, they get to a point where it's their way of life and they use these children. It, it had the Franklin scandal. I don't know if anybody's aware of that one where they would bring a busload of teenage boys in to service people in Washington, D.C. They'd do a little tour of Washington, D.C. They'd service the politicians, and then they'd go back to their school. And the school was involved in that. And I asked Jimmy you Boots, know, did I, I, always, I, always hate, I always hate when we talk about these things and we say service and things like that. It's about grown men 
raping little boys and girls, traumatizing them for life, continuing a cycle of trauma inside of a family. These kids have mothers and daughters and people that care about them and brothers and sisters. And the trauma reaches so far. And that's where I guess I feel like I totally get where you're coming from. But in terms of introducing this to an audience that doesn't want to hear it, I, I, I just don't know there's an issue there in terms of how we talk about it and how we get past the fact that people refuse to believe that any of this stuff is real at any kind of level like you're talking about. Well, it's because they believe the media and you have to get past that. You are, it's, um, you know, I, I was shocked with the uh, situation that I researched myself here when I talked to, there was this Wetterling child. It was a big case here. And I talked to researchers that had found, the, I mean, this one woman was Diane Mulebar. He, she was investigating this thing for two decades now. And they have three, three um, confessions from three different people that were all involved in this kidnapping and killing of this Jacob Wetterling. The, each of them have multiple witnesses of them confessing. One of them were on tape. They have all these different uh, evidence along the way as far as a car, their car being at the site, a witness seeing it. I mean, just so much evidence. It's a slam dunk case. And the FBI covered it up and the CIA covered it up. Uh, J you know, Jim Rothstein said that there were 19 CIA agents there to cover this up. This happened in Minnesota. And th they covered it up and ended up planting it on another guy. And the evidence is so weak. In fact, they even planted bones that weren't human at the site. It, it was so weak. And they went with that story and wouldn't even look at the confessions. They wouldn't look at any of that stuff. And if anybody who has a brain would look at this, they would see, oh my gosh, there's so much evidence here. And the local news stations help them cover it up, even though they, we know th that many of the journalists know because they've talked about it behind the scenes. We have evidence of that. So it's sketch out that story for people, Sarah, for, for folks who don't know the who, what, when, where. It was Jacob Wetterling. He was kidnapped back in the, I think, late 80s, early 90s. His mother, Patty Wetterling, ended up running for Congress. And she was really connected. She ended up being head of this charity for children. She was, oh, she, she knew there were confessions and didn't want to hear them. Her husband is suspected of being, there's witnesses that saw him at the time with Jacob at, you know, sacrificing. He was friends with a guy that, that uh, they found child sacrifice stuff in his apartment and, this guy was a known pedophile and he was all in association with him. I mean, there's just so much evidence. I did a whole show on it and the local media supports these creeps. And that's when I, you know, I'm just completely disgusted with what I found in that one case. Cause it was very high profile. It was the highest profile case in the state I grew up in. And the fact that I learned these things firsthand um, made me aware of how, I mean, I'm just completely disgusted. But one of the things Jim Rothstein said is that he's been tracking all the journalists who's exposed these things at any level whose career has been completely destroyed. People don't get to hear this stuff. And why? It's because it's human compromise again. They will lose their media contracts. They will lose power and they don't want to make the people in power angry or they don't want to lose their position in society. It's all about human compromise. And until people realize that they're not getting the truth from the mainstream media, they're going to be, they're going to, well, they'll continue to be in denial and it's going to continue. The abuse and rape and torture of children are going to continue until they stop listening to the mass media and start doing their own research. So that's what they have on their shoulders. Kids are going to continue to be trafficked, abused, and murdered until you stop listening to the mass media and start doing your own research and, and listening to, to actual people on the ground doing the research. They have to start opening their eyes and minds. Okay. I said we would talk about compromise, and you've brought it up several times. I just think we need to dig into it one further okay. layer deeper 
because I think until you wrestle with it and kind of toss it around in your mind and understand it from a very kind of Machiavellian way, at least this is my opinion, you don't really get it. And that is that, you know what, if you were running an agency, let's say that was granting visas to foreign citizens, imagine the advantage you have if every key player in that small group of yours that you're running has been compromised. If you, if they're all pedophiles and you have pictures, you have videos, you have testimony, you know, their dirty deeds. Imagine the power, the complete power that you would wield over a group like that. And you would have the ability then to go to anyone who wanted access to that service that you provide, the visa service, and you could completely control, uh, what happens there. So I think and people until people really wrap the, wrap their head around that from a Machiavellian standpoint, this is exactly what you'd want if you were trying to get stuff done. Yeah, exactly. They've come to the conclusion that if they really want the power and control, they need to do this. And that's what they do. But you got to think about it at a very broad level. This is wars. This is, you know, taking over countries. This is controlling the leader in a country. I mean, it's pretty broad and it's pretty extreme and it's pretty thorough. So that maybe in a way brings us back to one of the things that I wanted to talk about, because especially that last part that you did, if we understand it, as soon as you shift it into that perspective, Sarah, we have a whole other problem to deal with in terms of, you know, you're associated with the very excellent Carson School of Business there at the University of Minnesota, or at least you used to be. You understand you've been in the business world. You understand that a lot of the business world is a kind of get or done kind of left hand path enterprise, no matter how you cut it. And so you can go look at Coca-Cola and a lot of people hate Coca-Cola because they'll point out the human rights abuses they do in this country or that country. And then you look at a, comp a corporation like DynCorp, right? Which is directly implicated in child trafficking, organ harvesting, the worst of the worst kind of things. And then there's all these little steps. So how big of a leap is it from DynCorp to Coca-Cola to what we're learning at the Carson School of Business, University of Minnesota? You know, how do we balance the ethics of we have to get it done. We have to make our numbers. We have to defend our country. We have to preserve our freedoms. It all gets really gray and murky really quickly, doesn't it? Or am I well, blurring you know, lines that don't need to be blurred? No, they do blur, but that's human behavior that causes it to blow up blur. A lot of the school business schools teach ethics. And a lot of the people that work at the business schools are are good people. They don't want you going out and harvest, harvesting organs. I mean, they don't, when they're teaching you business, they're not thinking that you're going to go out and harvest organs, but the business practices for harvesting organs and selling soda pop is pretty similar. I mean, you can apply the same principles to right. whatever it is that you're buying and selling. And even in politics, you know, when you're learning about politics and you have somebody owes you a favor and, you know, you wield more power than they do and all those concepts in, in light of ethics, it's the same thing, whether you're moral or whether you're using it in a really corrupt manner, the same principles apply. Does that make sense? Oh, it, well, it, it makes sense to me, but then that really, really brings us to the larger spiritual question and spiritual dimensions to all of this. And I don't know how we even begin to pull that apart, except maybe I would tee up as a, as a lead into that, the series of outstanding, just unbelievably groundbreaking interviews you did with Kevin Annette. So maybe you want to introduce folks to who Kevin is, a little bit about his background, and then some of the things you touched on in several of the interviews that you did. Well, Kevin Annette is a very, very courageous man. He realized, and there's a documentary that I have, I posted on my YouTube channel of his background, but he was a pastor that realized, a minister, and he realized that 
in his con- it's a long story, but in his congregation, a, a lot of them were Native Americans. And he ended up running into and learning about the problem of boarding schools, the assimilation camps or schools of Native Americans, and learned that over 50% of those kids that were sent when they were five and six to these schools to for simulation purposes to learn our culture didn't come out of there alive. They were killed. They were, they were treated so horribly that they die in these places. And he learned about all this, these stories about what happened and the abuses and the atrocities and he exposed it. And the church was heavily involved. The church was involved in the assimilation programs and it's very, very document, well documented these these schools, and at the time he was he was exposing the church that he was involved, in, and they didn't like that very much, and they went after him hard, and they instead of admitting their crimes and and being repentant, you know, and and saying I am so sorry and I can, we can't do this, they buckled down and got rid of him and covered up the crimes. And he realized that the church at the higher levels were not about taking the gospel seriously, not about taking the teachings of Jesus Christ seriously. They had another agenda going on. And that's when he woke up. Because people who take the teachings of Jesus Christ would never allow this to occur in their world and would never turn their back on the victims of these horrible abuses. Well, that, that's always kind of a loaded thing when we introduce Jesus Christ and Christianity. And I mean, where do you draw the line there? Because you can turn back the clock of history and try and find that pure starting point. And I've done it. It just vanishes. It slips through your fingers. Like Well, I don't sand. know where your audience so, is at with whether they, you know, a lot of people follow the teachings of Jesus. Um, but even if you're not a Christian, and you're more into the science of consciousness and stuff, the teachings at at some point, you know, what's good, you know, the light, you know, the emoto water, when you have hate, the water changes its shape. When you have love, it's a different crystal shape. We know that the feelings of love is about health and prosperity. We know it changes you at a very core level. And that's the the higher level consciousness that Jesus and those like him, uh, whether you believe in that character or not, is trying to teach people. Sure, sure. So as a representation, embodiment of uh, yes. kind of this good and in, in this good yes. versus evil dynamic, but then even that is problematic. I, I just, before we leave this too far, okay. I, I do want to talk about what you reveal in that interview, just at a high level, then people can go check into it, check it out and dig into it as deep as they want. But Kevin's revelations about what he personally experienced in terms of satanic practices, occult practices within the the Catholic church, within other church organizations that he's seen are truly startling. And it's another one of those, how can this be kind of moments? And I have friends who are, you know, still churchgoers or uh, Catholics still giving money to the church, despite all that's happened. And there's a major kind of shifting personal thing that has to go on in terms of, like you were saying about absorbing this information on the edge of understanding, expanding our understanding, relaxing a little bit and saying, I do live in a world where this stuff happens. What am I going to do about it? But I want you to maybe just share with people what that was like for you to first dig into this and understand what he saw and tell us what he saw, because the satanic part is just going to flip people out, especially inside the church. Well, you know, I've heard it from multiple different angles from multiple witnesses and things. And Jimmy Boots has his own story of the church being infiltrated and purposely putting pedophiles in place so they can launder money through the church and control the drug trade and the money needed for wars. That was more from a pure detective standpoint. And then from Kevin Annette's standpoint, what he learned about the satanic rituals. And the point is, is that the Catholic church, <laughs> I mean, this is where, you know, people who are Catholics are going to have a hard time with this. And, and it's because Rome wanted to control the people and they had a pagan religion which is 
you know, the worship of Satan and um, sacrificing children and, and animals. And to control the people, they put together this religion that they could control. That's what the researchers are finding. And they kept their practices of sacrificing humans in their church. And it's, it's, it's the common thread of using charities as fronts to be able to do really bad stuff. And if you really dig into a lot of charities, they, a lot of the charities are the fronts, unfortunately, for a lot of bad characters in the world because it's easy to hide there. They have no qualms about hiding behind. You know, we, a normal person would go, oh, my God, I can't do that. How could they do that? Well, they don't care. <laughs> they're killing a child. They don't care if they're going to hide behind a charity. And that's what people have to get mentally past is hiding behind a charity is not beneath these characters. Hiding behind the Catholic Church is not be beneath these characters. Creating a whole religion so they can control you is not beneath these characters. And that's hard, really hard. It doesn't mean that their whole foundation of understanding of Christ and Jesus, and that's why I talked about Jesus just a moment ago, doesn't mean that that is something they have to throw away. It's such a loving, great way to live. And they don't have to throw that away. It doesn't, it's, they just shouldn't support a structure that supports something that they don't believe in. When you first encountered Kevin's story and you dug into it and you interviewed him, what was most impressive to you? I don't know if impressive is the right word, but what really clicked for you and said, oh my God, this is true. This must be true. What was most significant in terms of the evidence that he has? Because he has personally witnessed some of this stuff, but is there anything else beyond that? I don't know if he personally witnessed it as much as he's talked to a lot of witnesses and learned, he's talked to families and he's well, he's didn't he say so he... many witnesses? Oh, maybe the actual rich, like he's seen pictures of the actual satanic rituals. I don't know if he walked in on one or not. Did he say he did? I don't remember him yeah, saying that. Yeah, he said he he said he interrupted one in Canada. Yeah, I th so in that way, yes. Um, but most of how he learned about it is just through talking and being a detective. You know, talking to so many people who are hurting. I mean, these people, these, these people who are suffering, they're hurting. And I, that's how I came to the conclusion that I believed them is because I talked to people who are hurting. And I talked to Rothstein who had proof. And I've talked to other people that are saying, who back Kevin. In order to, for me to, to vet Kevin, I talked to a lot of different people too, to make sure Kevin's story was true. It, it's, um, there's so many people hurting. And this, isn't, this is really serious because the people who go through this, they're in a lot of pain. I talked to a witness, his name was Scott the Survivor. I have a two-part interview of somebody whose dad was high up in the Democratic Party doing a lot of fundraising and stuff. And he procured children for politicians and for wealthy individuals in California and that area of the country. And he, this character explained what was going on. He was a victim and it was the most awful thing I've ever heard. He bore his soul. It was the first time he went public with it, and he bore his soul. And he talked about ritual sacrifice. He talked about these kids as young as six, five, six years old being, you know, lined up in abuse. And he said that sometimes they were so injured that you knew they weren't going to make it alive out of these things. And, and he said, you know, he was nine, and he was one of the older ones at the time, and so they'd comfort the younger ones. And it was just incredible, the stories. He went into detail that I'm, I can't go into. I just, I don't like to talk about it at that level of detail. But he did because he felt it was necessary. And I, you know, and I asked the detailed questions in that interview. And I welcome anybody to listen to it. I actually warn people that you might have to shut it off and then turn it back on. It might take you four attempts to get through it. It's that shocking and it's that hard. And I, I don't think he's, I mean, you can just tell this guy is, bearing a soul. And this is what witnesses are going through, the trauma. I mean, it's one thing for me to hear about it and be traumatized. It's another thing for these poor victims to be trapped. They, they actually had to live through it. Right. So it's, it's really important, I think, fantastic for you to get that information out there. 
absolutely horrible that you have to get that information out there, that this is a reality, but absolutely, absolutely kudos to you for doing it, especially when you look at satanic ritual abuse and how it's portrayed, how it's covered up. Anyone who wants to follow, as you were alluding to, the the media stream there and how that story gets oh, just covered up again and again. And every time it pops up, there's some kind of phony baloney, false memory syndrome board certified, funded by Nambla kind of crazy mm-hmm. thing. Or then it's turned into satanic panic. Oh, isn't that ha 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 satanic panic? Wasn't that crazy? And then you go back and look at at McMartin and it doesn't look like satanic panic anymore. So do you want to speak to that at all in terms of how we've been mesmerized into believing that this isn't true? Because we certainly, like you said, Hey, we want to believe that this isn't true because it is hard to put your head on the pillow at night and think about this level of human suffering going on in your freaking neighborhood, well, I mean, you know, in so, your neighborhood. Sometimes it's hard to believe this level of trauma is going on unless until you suffer something yourself that kind of wakes you up or you see it yourself. It's just kind of human nature because it's so human beings. I, you know, I keep saying this is not normal. Human be normal human beings don't do this to children. So I still have some stumbling blocks too, saying, thinking that there's just something wrong with these people that are beyond what I understand at this moment. You know, maybe there's some science I don't understand that's being used against them. I, don't, I just don't understand how a human being can do this. But the media, how they cover it up is, you know, like Ben Swan, he was a Fox 9 journalist uh, who actually did a serious investigative work on Pizzagate. It was really objective. It was really good. He didn't come to any conclusions, but he just didn't laugh about it. He didn't mock it. He just seriously talked about it. The next day he was off the air. Anybody who doesn't mock and laugh at it is let go. And they they can't work again. I mean, that's what they do. Yeah, the Pizzagate story is really an interesting one to delve into. And I've covered it a couple of times on this show because I think it represents this kind of crossover between get or done politics, left hand path, and the very dark do what thou wilt kind of satanic infused Luciferian kind of stuff. But the thing that I always think is intriguing about Pizzagate is, is that they totally won the story in terms of controlling the narrative, right? So you mentioned Pizzagate today and everyone goes, oh, it's this guy who went in with his gun and shot up this pizza parlor. You know what I mean? It and makes I go, everybody well, look like idiots. Yes. Exactly. And it's like, you know, well, it's that's not what it is to me. What it is to me is a bunch of emails that show John Podesta, highest Democratic operative, conversing with Dennis Hassert, highest ranking Republican operative, and the connection being that Dennis Hassert is a convicted pedophile that the judge at the time of sentencing says, you're the worst of the worst in terms of any ones that I've, that I've seen. So anyone who's objective, like you're saying, and just starts looking at that data, it looks a heck of a lot different than something we can just dismiss But without going into that, one of the things that we might shift into and talk about is politics. I mean, can we really, I always worry when someone takes a political angle on this, because it certainly seems to transcend all of that. I saw the interview with uh, Jimmy Boots and, you know, both you guys are talking about Trump. I mean, uh, hey, hooray, you know, drain the swamp. But do we really believe that Trump isn't compromised to some degree? We already have all of the evidence to suggest that to some degree he is probably compromised enough, right? I don't know. I knew I know that he's better than Hillary Clinton was. Yeah, and, forget all that. Forget it. Yeah, of course, you know. Well, this is what my sources say is that there's two factions in the deep state and 
Trump is being supported by the faction that wants to take down the real bad guys. That's, you know, he, he's, he's compromised with the mob and making money and stuff, but there's a line when you start killing kids and you start drinking blood. I mean, just doing really bad. There's lines that get crossed, you know, making money and being a, a mobster in the sense of just a pure business guy, you know, that's okay. Different. But, so that's one line. I, I'd grant you that's a really interesting discussion to have. I agree. Most people would agree. There's a there's a line when I'm standing up there with my satanic robes and you know making a snuff film about the murder of a kid. But there's also the Jeffrey Epstein line over here where hey, it's okay to you know coerce some 15 year old girl into having sex at a party, you know, that's not a line in terms of politics. That's a line that makes you unelectable, you know, and it's kind of like uh, Hillary Clinton, who knows the horrible things that she's done. But at the very least, the Pizzagate emails and the spirit cooking makes her unelectable to a population that just will not process that. So, that's what I always wonder about. I mean, politics, aren't all these folks compromised? Well, I, you know, that's a question that everybody has to answer themselves because it's really ugly, right? But I asked Jimmy Boots, I said, is Trump a pedophile? Has he been with any underage person? And we all know Trump's a womanizer. I mean, I, you know... <laughs> He's a womanizer, but so was Clinton. And so was, I don't know, probably half the, you know, Kennedy was. So well, Clinton was Clinton was a rapist and we yes. have proof of that. We He's have beyond concept. that. Yes. But so but, but Trump, I th Trump, I think we have, you know, testimony that is very convincing from girls who were 16, 17, 1, 15, who says, yeah, he hit me, hit on me on this party. And he was quote unquote, dating other models, quote unquote. Well, in but, this hold on a second. Age. but I, uh, my understanding well, from detectives and people is that he isn't a pedophile. He has women problems and he loves beautiful women and he all, he, but he's never actually went after children. And if he had, this is what Jimmy Boots said, if he had, we'd have it on him because we knew all the pedophiles in the city and we, did ha we didn't have anything on Trump. So if he's hitting on some of these girls, I would say maybe he, maybe he was hitting on a 16-year-old, but maybe he didn't realize she was 16. Maybe he thought it was 18. Right. And maybe he didn't care. Maybe he thought it wasn't right. a child once they were 16. I don't know. Right. I right. can't go there, but my my information, my intel tells me he's not a pedophile. I, that I've dug. I, I into. would go exactly the the, and I have one tenth, one hundredth of the information that you do. But just the optics of the situation line up to me with exactly what you're saying. A guy who you know wants to be a player and will look the other way you know is she 18 i don't know she said she was 18 yeah so we all get that and that is different than standing up there in the robes with a five-year-old that's going to be killed at the end of your ceremony so we get that distinction too so but still we have this question of politics I mean, can we really pick sides here you know you got franklin scandal all republican you got the or, or mostly Republican. You got all these other scandals, Democrat. I mean, does any of that stuff make any difference? Aren't these people linked at some very are. deeper evil way? They're all linked. I, that's why I don't like the left-right paradigm. I always say the left-right paradigm is a, is a fallacy. They're all linked and it, they're all doing what the deep state bidding is. And this, the stuff that they allow us to decide on are the things that doesn't really affect much. And they have us arguing over things that aren't really important to them. They don't care if we, you know, certain things, whatever they allow us to argue on in the media, they don't really care. They let us make certain decisions and make it seem like we are in charge, but we're not at the very high levels. The monetary supply, <laughs> I think we're in charge of that. The Federal Reserve is an independent from the government, private institution that makes all of our money decisions and we don't get to know what they're doing. That's deep state. That's our money. 
it, can you imagine running your household but not being allowed to know how much money is coming in and what you're spending? Would you feel like you were in charge of your household? Sarah, you touched on something and we chatted about it for just a second before we hit the record button. And that is the journalism part of that. What has that been like for you? What has that kind of transformation been from being where you said you were this business game changer kind of thing to now? I got to believe you're heavily into this investigative journalism kind of thing. You're certainly... You, you ought to be because you're fantastic at it and you're playing such a vital role in getting this information out. But maybe you want to speak to both your journey and more broadly, you know, what's the future for independent investigative journalists like you? Well, I, my journey started with cures for cancer and autism and all that stuff and seeing how top cancer doctors are being killed and and then, you know, talking to victims of, of abuse and seeing what the deep state's doing to go in and taking over the natural resources of countries. And, and then you realize, I don't have a choice. This is what I have to do. It just naturally went in that direction. That I, I, it's a, How can I talk about the edge of what's going on in society without talking about this? Because nothing, okay, I'm talking to a scientist that has a great cancer potential you know, treating potential, but he's worried about getting killed and how to do it in stealth mode. You know, I'm like, well, how do I properly cover these things unless I start talking and diving into all these other things? But it's just a natural progression. Anybody I think that is in journalism, they're either controlled or they eventually go into some of this in whatever realm. You, you're talking about consciousness and things. And so you're going into that a little bit too, because it's like, well, I can't not, because it does affect consciousness and our understanding. And, you know, whether we decide that we're going to be light, I, I don't know how, how your show operates. And so I don't know how you, you know, you categorize this stuff, but it really affects your own consciousness and what you decide that you're going to be in life. And that I don't have a choice. I'm like, I just have to do this. And I have a lot of um, skills at understanding and putting pieces together and mapping out big picture infrastructure and how all, everything ties together. And, and so I think I'm drawn to doing that in that way, but with the details that I'm exposed to. Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. I mean, that's a deep question for me, and I, I don't feel I have – I don't even know half the time why I do it other than the fact that I just have to. Oh, I, I think you answered it beautifully. I, I understand your answer. And, you know, just between you and I, I mean, my path is different but somewhat similar. I had a business path, much like yours, and I sold my company, and I was like, okay, great. What do you do now? Well, you – you have an opportunity to answer the biggest questions, right? Who are we? Why are we here? Kind of stuff. So let's talk to people. Let's talk to people who profess to know the answers. And my orientation was to say, well, let's look at science. And I was surprised that one, there were these scientists who said, well, mainstream science is completely dropping the ball and we can start with consciousness. And they're pushing this agenda that you're a biological robot in a meaningless universe, and we all know that's just complete absurdity. No one lives that. No one lives their life has no meaning, that their kids have no meaning, that their wife has no meaning, that these uh, that love has no isn't real. It's just a biological process. So then that kind of led into some of this stuff. Was like, why are they pushing that so much when it doesn't work? scientifically or philosophically, let alone spiritually, when we go into the spiritual traditions and they go, well, they, of course not, you know, but so that kind of got me to the same thing, to, to some of the same places. And that's how it kind of intersects with your work is when you keep asking that, how can this be question? How can this be? You do bump into these questions of what is the nature of this evil, this resistance, whatever you want to call it, this do what thou wilt vibe that is out there that we all know is, is kind of counter to our greater good, to the highest part of us. So that's what I keep picking and poking away at. And Well, why, the question is, why are there some people like us that can't fathom doing, hurting another person? You know, like that's not 
I, that's not what I'm about. I can't hurt another person in that way. It would it would hurt me too much, right? I feel like hurting them would hurt me. And I mean, I just, you can't do that. Why do they feel that they can? Why is that lifted from them? I don't want to say it as a lifted. It's not like it's a burden yes. for me, but it, it you know, right. why don't they have that? And that's why I say it's not normal. I think a normal human being has that. Like the baby sparrows who was telling, I just had a, a show on and they were talking about the baby sparrows and this, the crows come in and, and hurt the baby sparrows and the, the, all the adult sparrows now team up and, and when there's a crow around and they, they get rid of the, the crow so it won't hurt the baby sparrows. And it's not their baby, it's the, the baby of their neighboring sparrow, but they do it together. You know, a species behave that way. Why aren't we? I'm with you, but then we got Jane Goodall, right? Awesome stuff. But then 20 years later, murder shows up, right? So Jane Goodall goes into the jungle, finds that we are not alone in terms of having a consciousness. She's observing it now. Mm -hmm. These chimpanzees are doing all the things that we associate with culture, with learning, with tool building, with caring, with compassion. And then what is it? 20 years later, they're also demonstrating murder and jealousy and all those other things too. So I love your question. I love your question and I love your quest. And I, I love that you're onto that, onto asking that question, you know, what, what is the nature of that evil? Because I think that that also has to reveal to us what's the nature of good as well. And, you know, and I, I just thought throw one other little tidbit in there is that I almost see it the other way is I do see myself as capable of evil. You know what I mean? And not that I've ever done any of those horrible things, but it's not beyond my imagination that someone would murder somebody that someone would want to dominate somebody. Now, that's not my thing. I would never do that to a kid. I have four awesome children, and the thought of that happening to any one of them crushes my heart. But I would be lying if I said that that, that is uh, uh, completely inconceivable to me. And I think that's the nature of well, humanity. Don't you is think that, that we can... Don't you think we all have a, a want for power and prestige and, and money exactly. and, and feeling important? But I, I, there's a point, though, when you're going to murder and hurt children. Maybe it's a mother thing. I don't know. I, but I can't. Well, no, I, I mean, I think we have the I think we develop healthy, uh, healthy barriers to to whatever the nature of that voice is. If that voice is from within side of us or if that voice is assisted in some way from something that is in some other dimension that's mm -hmm. saying, you know, do these horrible things. Uh, we've developed a, 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 a guided post that says whether it's Jesus or whether it's Krishna or, or, who, or, or, or just whatever form it is, says, no, you know, I choose to look up. I choose to see the light and follow the light. And we also see that other people, they fall into a darkness that they can't seem to get out of. And I, I, I do think we have to understand that. Yeah, what is that darkness? You know, I have a scientist that says that their brain structure, they can actually tell a, sci a, so a sociopath or a psychopath's brain structure. It's different. They can, we can actually tell that now. And when somebody's four or young and they're developing into a psychopath, we can fix it at that age so that they develop into a healthy human being. Uh, you know, they're probably tra being traumatized in some way. I don't know if you develop into a psychopath just on your own. Maybe you do. That would be a very interesting. But there are some ways to identify it now. We have that technology. I don't know if that identifies everybody, though. I, is that an end all? I don't know. And is it 100% accurate? Who knows? Those are great questions. Sarah, tell us where your work is going from here in the immediate, in the immediate future. What interviews you have scheduled are coming out on your channel. And then maybe in longer term, where do you plan on going with this work? Well, you know, I have a show that I just put up and I have part two coming up. It's a black operations happening in Haiti where we don't know exactly what happened, uh, but the Haitian prime minister went on CNN and claimed that, that this black operations, these eight people were arrested by Haitian authorities. And he claimed that they were there to 
murder him. But then there's other suspects that maybe he was there to they were there to rob the National Bank because the being in the National Bank is across the street from his office. So nobody really knows exactly what happened. But the prime minister was just asked to step down too. So and these eight mercenaries, the United States came in and negotiated their release out of Haiti. So it's very interesting. I have Izili Danto back on, who was the first lawyer, who was a lawyer for the first democratically elected president in Haiti back in the early 90s. She is amazing. And that's who uh, I'm interviewing on that. I also have Jimmy Boots coming back. I'm interviewing, I'm going, uh, visiting him this weekend, and I'm interviewing him as well. I also am trying to arrange, if people are familiar with Timothy Holmseth, who is trying to d disclose a lot of human trafficking and terrible abuse, he has just been jailed. He's been fighting for his life. But he put in a affidavit into the court with naming names and evidence, and it was on a uh, little thumb drive. And lo and behold, the court lost all that those uh, documents, and now we're trying to track it down. And... They're also replacing the judges and putting statewide judges onto his case. People are worried that he might get killed in jail. I mean, there, it's a very, very serious. His rights, his constitutional rights have been uh, violated. The, his situation is a landmark situation. If he wins, it would be a landmark case. But they, are, they do not want him to win because the information he has is huge. He has a lot of people now rallying behind him and not just, you know, average people. He has people who are ex-CIA. He has high level attorneys and, and judges and all sorts of people that are coming to his aid now. And I am so happy that we're starting to see a coalition of people that are getting it and trying to help these people who are warriors out there trying to do what's right. Now, Tim Holtzeth has a different perspective than me. He's way on the edge. I mean, he'll, he's not afraid to say it like it is. And people listening might think that I'm like that listening to this interview, but I mean, in comparison, he'll just, he's had enough. They've been attacking him for a decade. And so now he's just like, I'm, I'm done. I, you guys are, you're trafficking in children and he's just going after them and they do not like it. But, you know, that's a big case going on right now. And I, I'm worried about his life, his safety, and he has great people that are around him. I'm trying to get an interview set up with um, that situation with some really great people who are helping him out as well. So that's my immediate long term. I'm just going to continue to bring light and change and try to get as many people to understand um, what we're facing and join you know, the army of people trying to bring better, you know, more love and light into this world. Let's not treat people this way. You know, we all have our flaws. We're all going to want power and prestige and all that stuff. But there's a line. <laughs> Let's not hurt each other. Let's get rid of the trauma. Let's build healthy human beings and healthy communities. That's where I'm going. Oh, that's great. That's absolutely great. And so the best place for people to find you, they can find you pretty easily on YouTube. What are some go-to Google searches that people ought to use to find you? Of course, I'll have links in the show notes, but I always like to give people the, you know, just Google this. If you put my name, it comes up. Lots of shows come up. Um, but, you know, Jimmy Boots, you can get his name through and, my, you know, Usually my interview with him comes up, but if you put my name, you'll find me. My website, sarahwestell.com, um, my YouTube channel. You can sign up for really, my newsletter. It's really easy for people to spell. It's just like it sounds, W-E-S-T-A-L-L, so yep. just so folks know. And then Sarah, I mean, if you spell it wrong, it usually still comes up, but it's S-A-R-A-H. But yeah, it'll, it'll come up, and uh, I suggest that people sign up for my newsletter if they want to hear my shows, because... A lot of I have almost 100,000 subscribers on YouTube right now, but a lot of those people don't get alerts when my shows come up. And so if you signed up for my newsletter, I you'll be alerted. Admit, I really? YouTube? Yeah. YouTube is <laughs> yes. altering the distribution of content that isn't suitable, that isn't uh, suitable to whoever is pulling their strings. Hey, and just by the way, so people know, we've been mentioning Jimmy Boots, and then we've been interchanging Jimmy Rothstein, same person. And you'll find, like Sarah said, you'll find those interviews. Listen to those. Those are a great starting point because, as you alluded to, the credibility just 
comes oozing out of this guy. It's like, yeah, try and poke holes in this guy's story. He was right there. But so, yeah, easy to find Sarah Westall. Any other services or things that you do that people might be interested in? Well, you know, the, uh, the, well, there's a book I was, <laughs> the Q book. I'm not really, for people who don't know Q, that's the, that group of people who Q puts out these messages and then people are following and learning and, and so forth. And I never really followed Q, but what I like about Q is that a lot of people are learning a lot from Q and what he's posting. And there was a Q book that I was asked to be part of. And what I did is I posted my narratives or not near transcripts of my interview, a couple of my interviews with Jimmy Boots in that. And also solutions to some of these problems. There, there's my last interview with Jimmy Boots is solutions. And we need to get a lot of people involved. There's real solutions. It's also what a family should do if their child was taken. And the interesting thing is, is, you know, we couldn't get, we, we want as much exposure for this as possible. And the Q book went to number one. It beat out the McCabe book, Deep State McCabe book, right after a 60 minute interview. And then Amazon, actually, it went to number one in three different categories. It went to number two overall, but we think it would have went to number one because they deleted hundreds of uh, reviews and messed with it and actually decrease the price and all these things to try to get the publisher to not, you know, can't make money. But they kind of, they planned that Amazon was going to play with them that way, where they would lower the price to the point where they would have to pay Amazon to sell it. So that's the other thing I got. Great. Great. Well, again, folks, our guest has been Sarah Westall. You can check her out in all those ways we were just talking about. Sarah, best of luck with your work. And thanks again so much for joining me on Skeptico. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. After the interview with Sarah, we had a little bit of follow-on conversation, and I've included some of that in here as well. If you get a chance, go to my last show that I did with them and look at the solutions. If you could talk about that and share that with your audience, I would really appreciate that. Yeah, I'm just, it just, it knots my stomach up. I know. When we talk about solutions, I guess part of it is when you say, if your child is taken, and then immediately the, I just feel the blood just draining from my body, you know? I can't imagine one of my kids. I know. It's just important for people to know that, though. For me, that's not my thing. Me exposing folks to you, they they can find that, and they will find that. Okay. Yeah, it's hard. I know. What I like to do is, and especially because, you know, guys especially, you know, people who continue to bury their head in the sand and just don't want to deal with this, sometimes I think they need to come at it a little bit from that intellectual angle that you touched on beautifully, you know, with the science part of it. Well, I think that uh, uh, psychopath uh, uh, stuff, my wife is forensic psychologist. I love her to death, but that's complete nonsense. It's just bullshit. The nature of consciousness, everything we know, you know, that's like back to my skeptical thing is, okay, near-death experience. We, with 200 peer-reviewed papers, we get it. Consciousness extends bodily death in some way we don't understand. So get over it. It's not about the freaking brain. I mean, the brain is somehow involved in channeling this consciousness, but it's not, it's not about the brain. Will the brain get you stuck in operating in an evil mode though if it has a certain structure to it or does the brain structure change because you are i mean the chicken the egg might be exactly but but a lot of children are exposed to trauma and purposely to get them to do trauma later on others exactly well that's the whole neuroplasticity thing and that's proven but yet the materialistic scientific phony science agenda fits into this in terms of they're, they don't acknowledge even neuroplasticity. So the, the fact that your brain is, like you said, is a chicken and the egg. So if you think evil thoughts, your brain changes. If you go and look at the brain of a, somebody who's meditated for 20 years, Buddhist, it, the brain is different. Well, that's because what your thoughts create your brain, not the other way around. So that whole, all that research, we're going to go study psychopaths and stuff like that. And then we don't even know about you know about epigenetics?
Thanks again to Sarah Westall for joining me today on Skeptico. Please check out her YouTube channel. She has a lot of fantastic interviews up there. The one question I tee up from this interview is, what does human compromise, human exploitation, blackmail have to do with the larger spiritual question of evil? And where do we draw the line? How do we know personally what's right and what's wrong and when someone has stepped over that line? This is a question that has been asked forever and asked on this show and asked through the ages, but it has a different angle when we look at it through the lens of this interview. So I thought it'd be fun to chat about it. Please join me on the Skeptical Forum or otherwise connect with me and tell me what you think about this question. Beyond that, of course, check out Skeptico.com for my library of all the previous shows, all available for free for download. And keep listening because I have, I think, some good shows coming up, and I hope you stay with me for all of that and that you enjoy this and that you find it worthy of sharing with other people who might enjoy it as well. Until next time, take care, and bye for now. So thanks for watching this video, and if it wasn't really a video, but just an audio, stored as a video, I apologize. But there's more videos out there as well, but please check out the Skeptico website. You can see it here. We cover a lot of different stuff you might be interested in relating to controversial science and spirituality. A lot of shows up there, over 350 of them or so, all free, all available for download. So do check it out. Mm -hmm.